Are you seeking a better way to accelerate your sales, to scale your business, to live a life with no limits? Accelerate Sales Podcast features global experts who have cracked the code to recurring revenues with proven sales systems and get you on the fast track to scaling. Now let's accelerate your sales with today's episode. Welcome to the Accelerate Sales Podcast. From George today, you're going to learn three key things. One is how to recruit amazing talent in a very, very tight marketplace, which I'm sure you know. The second is what roles to recruit. And some of the roles that he talks about, I'm pretty sure you haven't heard of, and it's a really great perspective. And the third thing is how to create a content machine for both attracting clients, but more importantly at the moment is to attract high quality talent. Welcome to the Accelerate Sales Podcast. If it's your first time and you love what you hear or see, please subscribe. And also, if you've been listening for a while, just a review would be fantastic. And if you're new, welcome. And if you want to see more of this content, please subscribe. Now, you're welcome to take notes. That's entirely up to you, but you might be walking, running, riding your bike like I often do. Uh, what you can do is get a summary at paulhigginsmentoring.com forward slash podcast. You'll see the episode here with George. And also, there's a full transcript that you can also request as well at the website. Uh, I do take plenty of notes. So I look down, so uh, I am listening to George intently, but it's just the way that I capture those best notes for you. And I'd like to quickly thank our sponsors. So I'd like to thank the Cloud Consultants Collective. It's a peer-to-peer -peer group, free group on Slack that's helping peers that are cloud consultants to scale faster. You can go to paulhigginsmentoring.com forward slash CCC to find out more. And also Leadjet. So Leadjet is just, or Leadjet.io, I should say, is a fantastic tool that allows you to take a lot of the manual lifting out of LinkedIn into your sales CRM. It uh, removes that for you. So you can go to paulhigginsmentoring.com forward slash Leadjet. So as I said, George is an entrepreneur, a podcast host, and a product strategist. And he really combines his passion of creativity, technology, and most importantly, an award-winning culture to work with some of the biggest companies in the world. And that's what he really focuses on in this show. He also um, you know, works uh, or he's worked with companies that have gone from a startup to an IPO. And uh, he's just got lots of lots of experience that he shares. And he's got a real passion for how people work. And I think at the moment, that's a, a absolute uh, awesome skill to have. And uh, he shares very openly with you. So what I'll do now is hand you over to George Brooks from crema.us. Welcome, George. Thank you, Paul. It's good to see you. Yeah, look, great to have you here. Um, and some of your achievements are amazing. Just doing the research again on you. So I'm very excited for you to share your wisdom on today's podcast, but why don't we kick off with um, you know who you love to work with and what problems you love to solve for them? Oh yeah, I, I could nerd out on this all day long. So I've had the pleasure of growing an organization um, that gets to allow people to explore their innovative ideas. So we we work with um, everyone from really well funded startups all the way through to global enterprise, helping them both explore design and build innovative products. So that's anywhere from software, web, mobile, uh, experiential, et cetera, uh, but really helping them dive into how do you think about the potential, right? Not just about the thing that you have to do day in and day out, but the potential of what might change your organization into what it will be next. Uh, right. So that's, it, that's, that's what I get to do all day long. Brilliant. And have you got an example that's public that you can share with us? Oh, the joys of that. What, what can we share out loud? Right. <clears throat> so yeah, we've had, um, uh, we do actually, and I'll be transparent. We have to be really careful with that. So our biggest clients are top five global consultants where we don't exist. And, you know, like we're behind the scenes making stuff happen, but, uh, some that I can share is we worked with, um, in the years past, we've worked with some really awesome startups. And some of those have gone on to um, both iterate on the products that they, they were trying to serve their markets with. So one was a, a, an organization called um, Endurance Lending Network. They were actually building a, a solution to basically help, how do you help franchisees get enough capital to, to buy into their next opportunity, but in um, a way that is too high a risk for most banks, Yes, and it's too little money for VC or private equity. 
And so what they were doing is a brilliant, um, uh, unique way of underwriting these, these organizations. And we built the technology that allowed that application process to be something that took, normally it would take two weeks and they could do it in like 15 minutes, uh, which included, you know, the co-signers and all of that. And it was great. It actually allowed them to validate their, their product market fit, actually get it into the hands of the users, get loans actually funded. And then they were able to be uh, merged with another organization in London, I think in London, um, called Funding Circle. And they became Funding Circle Worldwide. And they actually ended up going all the way to IPO. So that's a good example of where we helped to explore the opportunity, actually design it out, and then build it into a full, full-fledged product. Now, that was a few years back. Since then, we've built products that uh, allow big organizations to hire at scale. Right, so everybody's dealing with that right now. How do you find the talent? Right, there's a huge talent gap across the uh, the industry, and everybody's trying to say, how do I find the right person? How do I know if I can afford them? How do I know that they fit the right skills? And am I going to overpay somebody that's underqualified, or am I going to you know underpay somebody who's overqualified, etc.? And we've built multiple platforms actually for different clients on how to match people, not based off of just purely experience but off of skills. Like how can you actually map a match person with an algorithm that says, I need this. And this is what's most important to me as an organization. And we'll match you based off the fact that, yeah, you can do lots of things, but that one skill set, that one unique identifier is most important to us. So we were able to, to build products that can do things like that. Brilliant. Well, as you said, look, it's a burning, uh, platform everywhere. I don't know what it's like in the US, but here in Australia, you, you go past, even um, I laughed, I drove past a, a, a car yard, a car dealer. It's one of yeah. the biggest uh, biggest brands in the world. And they had a sign out the front asking for accounting staff, right? <laughs> not, not, not selling cars. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and every single organization we talked to is dealing with this. They, they can't find everyone from the individual contributor all the way up to key leaders. And, um, and, you know, of course with inflation worldwide and everything else, it's a big problem to solve right now. And I think technology and creative solutions are going to be a part of solving it for sure. Yeah. Great. Well, we'll dive into that again in a moment, but I just also wanted to ask about uh, blockchain and, you know, how, how, how much are you guys working with blockchain? What, what sort of the, what do you see the future of, of blockchain? Um, yeah, well, I mean, you can't, you, you cannot throw a rock without somebody talking about crypto, Web3, NFTs, you know, the whole bit. So the way that we, we actually just put out a series of episodes on our podcast, um, and, and the way that we would describe it is we like to practice what we preach, which is you need to have a posture of exploration all the time, whether or not you're doing it yet or not. You need to be exploring, at least getting your, your hands dirty, getting familiar with what's happening. Here's my take on it. <clears throat> One. There's a massive bubble being created by the NFT market, by cryptocurrency, and a, a number of different things. That's okay. There's always a bubble before infrastructure comes out of that bubble, right? Yeah. So what we're paying attention to is things like, okay, what could we do in the future with Ethereum, right? What could we do with Solidity? What could we do with things like Avalanche or maybe some of the, the protocols that are going to be more stable than if even Ethereum or, or um, Bitcoin might be right now. So we're paying attention to things. We're playing with them in our innovation labs. So that's more internal projects. And then we're trying to inform our clients like, yeah, you maybe don't need to jump on the bandwagon quite yet, um, especially because most people are really dealing with just basic problems of like how to serve their customers better. Yes. That cryptocurrency or Web3 is not going to be the answer to yet. Um, instead we're saying be informed, know what's coming, but then we'll be ready for it once that infrastructure comes out of it. So where will we see decentralization of software be important? Where will we see community-based work be more important in centralized, you know, um, behemoth organizations? So we're, we're getting close to it. We're playing with it. We've got a number of people here that are part of independent projects outside of CREMA. And uh, so we're learning. We're learning really, really, really fast. Of course, the last six months have been a whirlwind of change. Um, and we're seeing it slow down a little bit. So this is what we expected, right? We saw that bubble would come. It, it's going to have to kind of clean itself out. And then out of it, what will come out of it? And that's what we've done time over time, whether it was Web 1.0, you know, just a simple website, Web 2.0, applications for everything, or Web 3.0, this decentralization of computing power. So yeah, we're excited for it. 
but we, we like to be on the cutting edge, not always on the bleeding edge, because we want to make sure that we're making the right decisions for our clients. Yeah, that's great. And, and obviously, any advice that George has given, given there is uh, not, not investment advice. No, nope, so no financial. You go have and, to say it correct, whenever you go bring and it up. Seek, yep. uh, go and seek your own independent advice. But look, that's uh, right. it's, it's, it's certainly an area that I'm focusing on. I think, you know, for me, it's like, you know, how does it improve real problems in the world? And I think, you know, there's, there's some now that are doing that and that they're the ones that I'm really following as as well. And you spoke about, you know, um, you know, getting uh, teams, optimizing teams, if I can put it that way, and, and also yeah. the recruitment piece. So first, you know, what are some of the learnings that you've taken out of this skill software matching that, you know, if we're, if we don't have the software where, you know, like a 15 person cloud consulting business and we want to go and uh, recruit the next five people where at the moment, like you said, it's incredibly difficult to mm-hmm. find them. You know, w- what learnings can we take out of what you've done from the software and your research that we can apply into our business? Yeah, I think there's there's a number of things to touch on there. One is <clears throat> there's 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 a pretty uh, wide range of uh, skills experience that we're seeing organizations hire for. The challenge is is that because there's so much demand for work to be done, everybody's going straight after senior roles. Mm-hmm. And so one of the, there's two sides of it. One is where can you create space that yes, you need to get those senior roles in place. So how can you make sure that you're you're matching that skill? to what you need today. And then also, how do you look for the up and coming talent? Because you have to keep that balance that any organization cannot be too top heavy or too bottom heavy, right? And so how do you build that relationship between investing in the next future, right? The next talent wave, and also making sure that you can get things done right now with with those experienced folks. So that's one piece of it. That's kind of one uh, vertices, if you will, if you're looking at a, a chart. And then the other one is what roles do you actually need? Now, I think a lot of people default to, I need salespeople and I need developers. It's like, those are the two things that we have to have more of, more salespeople and more devs. And what what we find is that actually there's some missing roles in there that people forget about. And we refer to that, especially when you're in a technology space, whether you're building your own custom technology or whether you're supporting and um, um, implementing technology, there are a number of different roles that come into play. So we refer to that as a product team. So at Cremo, this is really what we offer to our clients. We offer product teams. So what does that look like? For us, that looks like usually, yes, there are developers on that team. There's someone, whether that is a a custom developer or an implementation developer, someone who's going to help to integrate this into your environment. There's usually someone who has a creative role. So that might be a product designer. It may be a brand or communications or change management communicating communications designer, someone who can think creatively, not that all the roles aren't creative, but someone whose role is actually to communicate with design. That's a role that's often forgot. We all go, well, if the thing functionally works, who cares what it looks like? Yes. Your users care. That's who cares. <laughs> yes. And, yes. And then, then, we, then we look at product managers. So that might be product or project managers, depending on the way your organization approaches it. The only real big difference between product and project management In my opinion, and there's lots of different opinions on this, but project management is more about just the things to get done and making sure that they're kept straight. Product management is about saying, yes, that needs to be true, but it also needs to be an extreme focus on the business value. Why are we doing this? Why is this the next priority? Why is this feature more important than that feature? Because you can't build them all at once, right? So a product manager, a great product manager will be considering both the business value, the product value, and then the customer value. So a product manager, a designer, developers, and then the the kind of the last piece of it is a quality assurance or test engineers, what we would refer to them as. So who's making sure that both the work that you're planning to do has some level of like, this is when we'll know it's great. And then on the flip side, we've built a thing is it great? <laughs> you know, like, did we build the right product? Is it going to serve the customer in the right way? You can do that through automation. You can do that through manual testing. There's lots of ways, but a great quality assurance person, a great test engineer is really going to be focused on, is this experience producing the value we intended it to? 
And so when you can answer yes to that, then you're ready to ship it at scale, right? You could probably ship to a small group of users, but if you're ready to ship at scale, maybe to an entire workforce or to an entire customer segment, you better make sure that you've done that time to, to test it, to make sure that quality is high. Now we would say here at Crema, everybody's role is user experience, yes. the developers, the designers, the product managers, and everybody's role is quality. So we try with, even with titles, we try to, to remove this. Oh, it's the QA's role to make sure that quality is met. No, it's everybody's role, but a test engineer is going to apply it in a unique way to make sure that we're accessible, that we're meeting the requirements that was set out to meet and that we're actually releasing products that are going to change the world. Yeah. Brilliant. So, so really love the, the group of roles. And I'm sort of thinking back to some of the gaps we had in our team when we used to develop products and, uh, yeah, anyway, that's water under the bridge now. I've got to move on. But uh, as far as the the way you recruit, you know, what's, what's changing around the way you recruit those people? So, I mean, what they say, culture eats strategy all day, right? So yeah. we are we are nerds about culture. Now, it's one thing to have an incredible culture inside your organization where you're, you're looking at your operations, you're looking at your HR policies, you're looking at your perks and benefits and everything else and saying, these are great. We want to keep our people happy so we can retain those. That's table stakes now, right? I mean, every organization has is at least trying to catch up with that. And the ones that aren't, they're in, they're in a world of hurt right now because you know the workforce has all the options, yeah. right? They can go anywhere they want to work because now the whole world is their, their, work, their, um, their office. Um, they can get paid nearly anything they want to get paid. So, I mean, the real thing is, is how do you present both a, um, a culture that has a strong purpose and a culture that actually practices what they preach. Now, the challenge with that is when you're recruiting somebody, every single person that's going through the interview process assumes it's a bait and switch, right? Because they're, they're, you know, they know they're being sold. Hey, come work for me. It's the best place in the world. And then they assume on the other side, it's probably not as good as they say. So a couple things have to happen. One is as you recruit people, you, you do need to be honest that it's not going to be perfect, but it's going to be great. And then on the inside, it better be great, right? So you have to create an organization where people actually thrive and they flourish. Um, then I'm, I believe in storytelling. As soon as you have a great story to tell about the teams that you're creating, then you are going to capture that in any content form you can and tell the world. So for us, that looks like having a YouTube channel. It looks like having a podcast. It looks like having a active blog. It looks like having um, social media accounts that are posting all the time. And those serve the two sides of the coin for us. One side of the coin is sales. And one of the sides of the coin is recruitment. And both of those are sales. <laughs> and so we're always looking to say, like, how do we sell people that Crema is where they would want to come work? How do we sell people that they should hire Crema to work with them? And we do that through storytelling, through creating content that says, this is how we think. This is what we do. This is why we think it matters. And um, we're going to be as transparent as possible that there's no secret sauce. This is a food we want to share around with everybody. Great. And is there any sort of framework that you use for the storytelling? Anything that we can can go and implement out of the way that you storytell? Oh, well, we should create a framework. I don't know that we have a like an official framework framework. Um, I think that the the big piece is we we have inside of our organizations, when I went back to those those few roles that we talked about, whether it's product management, design, development, test engineering, the way that we think about those is what we call craft teams. So we think about becoming experts in our craft. So go back to this kind of old language of the master and apprentice trying to become an expert in their, their craft. And we really want to say <clears throat> that if we can put out content into the world, investing into other people becoming experts in those crafts, so putting out dev content, putting out product design content, putting out product management, best practices, et cetera, then what will happen is we will see people that go, I learned from you, now I want to work for you. And we'll also see people in other organizations say, I learned from you, now I want to hire you. Yes. And so I think as much as possible, it's share what you're doing, right? It, we often overthink how to create content. And most of the times it's as simple as saying, 
answer the question, what did you do today? And why did it matter? And um, so we do that through a number of different ways. And we try to have fun with it because let's be honest, you know, B2B software, B2B business can get real boring real fast. And so I, I like to say, let's have fun because the reality is, is we like to laugh. We like to, uh, we don't take ourselves too seriously. We take the work seriously. And so how can we actually try to create content that would both be entertaining and informative? And so that looks like us doing a series called devs on a couch. And it's literally just devs sitting on a couch chatting about what they do all day. And then, or designers discuss what are they doing? It's designers discussing the newest tools or practices or pro- processes, or uh, the best one is product uh, winding down with product managers where they fill up glasses of wine. They all drink wine and they sit around and talk about product management. And again, it just humanizes this work that we want to sometimes make uh, overly formal yes. when in reality it's human work. We just happen, it's people, right? We just happen to be designing and building software that's changing the world. Yeah. And, and you know, how much of it or what sort of the time commitment a week as an example that you'd put into to content yeah. that, you know, both attracts clients and also those uh, craft experts? We may be a little um, unique in this. So we're not a, we're not a massive organization. We're about uh, 50 to 60 people, uh, which feels big to me being, you know, the guy that still views myself in my second bedroom. Um, <laughs> but, um, but what's cool is early on, we invested in what we call a growth team. And you could call it a marketing team. You could call it a sales team, but it includes uh, sales folks that are that are actually nurturing and, and building relationships. It includes marketing specialists that are looking at SEO or best kind of um, naming schemes. And then it also includes content creators. So those are copywriters. And then I have a multimedia um, specialist that actually we shoot, film, edit, do it all in-house. There are lots of ways to get that done out of house as well, working with partners, whether it's another marketing agency or a sales organization. We just found that our story was unique enough that we wanted to invest in those roles in-house. So I have six full-time people that do not build a clients, not unless it's like a special circumstance, they do not build a clients. They are fully overhead roles inside of Crema. So if you ask, what's the time investment? It's six people, 40-ish hours a week, right? Yeah. And they are, they're, they're planning. They're thinking about the strategy of our content. They're, they're releasing content uh, multiple times a week. Then they're repurposing that content into different platforms. And then they're following up on that as people engage. Right. So as we get um, audience members commenting or resharing, then we're tracking those people down and saying, who are you and why are you resharing our content? And you should, you know, more about Crema? Of course you should. And we nurture those relationships over time. Great. And you talk about social media, which social media channels are working uh, well at the moment? Yeah, for, for sure. The, the two that are probably our strongest at the moment are LinkedIn. Uh, it's definitely for, we're in the B2B space. It's a store, a lot of business is happening. Although I'll be completely transparent. It is getting saturated with everyone selling to everyone. So we're seeing a bit of a shift in the fact that you're, the audience is not paying attention as much because it just, it's getting really noisy. So we're trying to figure out how do we break through that noise? Uh, the second is Twitter. Um, so we put out content where Twitter feels like it's still a very organic place to engage more directly with people, to invite people into a conversation, to have it be a little bit more organic. Those are probably our top two. We still post to, to Instagram for recruiting. It's not as big of a, um, a uh, net new sales lead, but for recruiting for sure. And with it comes Facebook, but honestly, Facebook's probably at the bottom of our rung right now. Yeah, yeah. And look, I agree. And I think Twitter, you know, mm. oh, sorry, on LinkedIn, you know, I've, I think I've chalked over 3 million views since 2019. So it's been fantastic to me. I still, you know, it's the majority of our outreach for, for clients is still through uh, LinkedIn. And we've got a cool way of doing it, which like you said, a bit of hum- human uh, element to it. So we sort of cut through the noise, but, but I do find Twitter is where the, you know, the I suppose the more the... Not the serious, but it's it's the more research happens on yes. on Twitter, and I think it's you know when you put it, you've got to put it, you know, your specific opinion in a very short short amount of characters, right? And I think that's where the real conversations seem to be happening more. Whereas LinkedIn now, like you said, it's it's a little bit more noisy. So we're testing more and more on LinkedIn. So um, uh, sorry, on Twitter versus uh, LinkedIn, yep. and then like you said, you've got your YouTube, and you know just 
you know, what a couple of key key lessons that you've learned around your YouTube channel, which we'll put all the links to obviously here in the show notes. Yeah. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> consistency is key. I mean, that's just number one. It's just, if you're not willing to produce content on a consistent basis, then o- you're almost irrelevant, which is unfortunate because I think that there's some incredible content out there that I'll come across and I'll go, Oh man, they only have 50 views or it's, you know, I hope those 50 views are the 50 people that absolutely need to see it. Yeah. And then to that point, you don't have to have, you don't have to be, you know, Joe Rogan or some, you know, a big superstar to have a meaningful impact to your content. So, you know, we have everything from some of our view or videos are only getting a few hundred views, but we'll get people that follow up with us. And I said, I watched that one video and I'm like, oh, you're one of the hundred and we only needed them to watch it. Just that one. So, so and, and to, to finish that kind of that bridge is you know, Crema is a small organization who looks for long time, lifetime value clients, right? So I need three a year. I don't need a hundred clients a year. We're not a high volume organization. Now, if you're selling a product, you're selling a SaaS solution, or if you're selling something that can withstand high volume, then you're going to want to get more eyeballs. For me, I need the right eyeballs. And that's true anyways, but, but you have to kind of measure your impact. So um, we, but we have other videos that have hundreds of thousands of views and it just was the right topic for the right time. And it took off and, and it led to lots more conversations. So, um, the other thing we're thinking about right now is short form, short form, um, video content. So yeah. that's things like YouTube shorts, TikTok, Instagram reels. They're basically all three, the exact same thing. You can repurpose the content across all three of those. Um, it's a great way to break through, especially things like TikTok. There is a growing business community on, on TikTok. Yeah. We haven't yet started posting, but we're building a backlog of how we might want to start release that out. And um, yeah, I mean, it's a, just the next experiment, it's the next iteration of the same thing we've been doing for the last ten years. Yeah, well, I'm, um, I'm a, a mad golfer, tragic golfer, and uh, I must admit, TikTok is my best friend. You know, I limit myself to fifteen minutes because it's so addictive. But, it's yeah. so addictive. The amount of golf uh, content I get on there, and the the thing I love about it is it just keeps feeding me more. Right, once I get that, the algorithm just feeds me more and more of it. So it's brilliant. But I am seeing more business pop up there, and yep. you know, I, I, you can't separate yourself, right? I'm not thinking well. Actually, I'm not going to ever think about work when I'm thinking about golf. So, yeah, I think That's exactly um, it, right. It's a really good one and uh, and worth testing. And and just around geographies, like uh, I, I got an um, amazing person I met the other day who spent some time don't donating his time in Rwanda as an example. So he started to build a community of developers in Rwanda now. Uh, He's on WordPress and it's going really well. You know, what are sort of some pockets of or geographies that you're seeing that some some people may be missing? Yeah, that's a great question. It it depends on what you're looking for. I mean, especially in the development space, we have decided, at least to today, and this won't be our future, uh, which is crazy for me to say, because for a long time, I said, you know what, we're keeping all of our talent in the U S our clients are in the U S I want to, I want to bring up the talent in the Midwest, but then COVID happened. (laughs) And so now we're hiring across the country and, and then really it's like, well, if across the country, why not across the world? And so we are starting to uh, enter, you know, start to explore where are those opportunities, you know, really challenging time frame is that, for example, Ukraine was an incredible place for hiring development talent. And it's been, it's really, we've had clients come to us say, we don't know what to do. This is where we were getting work done. There's so much um, disruption there. Um, we, we oftentimes will look for things in our, our similar time zones. So we'll look for um, Latin American companies or, um, you know, providers that are maybe in the kind of Brazil, Uruguay, uh, Chile kind of space. And so we're, there are pockets in those areas, especially when it comes to technical talent. Um, there's pros and cons with going either way. I used to say, here's the deal. I've seen people win huge using um, talent globally, but you have to know how to manage it and how to set clear expectations because what might happen organically in a creative studio in the Midwest in Kansas City, um, it takes a little bit more intentionality when you're starting to describe the thing you need to have done and the time frame to turn it around. So. Yeah, and 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 it's like that YouTube comment where it's consistency. Like for me, I've only ever had distributed teams. So you know, I've got teams in uh, the Philippines. In I've got yep. one team member here, but I've got teams in uh, in Colombia as well. And you know, it just works beautifully because that's all I'm. 
that's all I'm, I know, right? Exactly. I'll never exactly. be end because let's face it, when I'm on a dialysis machine, it was pretty hard to have a team meeting, right? So I always, uh, absolutely, I was, in a way, I was forced to to do that. But I, I do think, um, yeah, I think it's, um, you know, look, there's no right or wrong. It's it's your personal circumstance and it's what you love to yep. do. But I do think you can find some amazing people no matter where they live. And you know, a lot of people in, like you said, in Latin America that have studied in the US and they've gone back back home you know it's uh because of the cost of living there there's a there's a big difference my content writer is uh based in columbia she's brilliant she's a journalist in new york has gone back to to look after aging parents and you know it's like it, it's perfect so you can find it anywhere um, and multiple people on staff here at crema are from latin america i mean they're they're those that became u.s citizens and and they talk about that they're like there is there is a cyclical nature to how to support families back home and i i 100 agree with you and again it was primarily because i didn't know how to manage it yet yeah. now as we've grown as an organization we're looking for ways to do that because this is the future right we are we are becoming much more of a globalized uh, economy and resource and um i'm excited for that um, albeit it gives me a little apprehension. I'm like, I want to make sure that we do it well and that we serve our clients well and that we can still deliver the same way we have been for the last 14 years. Yeah. And like you said, you know, you, you work with some amazing tech uh, or building amazing tech for companies. What about uh, from a culture team's point of view? Is there any technology that you use that uh, helps you helps you with your culture? Oh yeah, we're. I think I wrote a blog one time that it was the 38 SaaS products I used to run my small little agency, and this was probably when we were only 25 people. It, the short answer is that I'm always experimenting with new tools because what I find is that the principles stay no matter what tool you're using. So, what does that look like today? So, I'll, I'll try to focus on today. For our development teams, we kind of have to stay with what the industry standard is, and that for that. It's Jira, right? It's the Elastian product suite because that's what our enterprise clients are using. I'll be honest, I went kicking and screaming into using Jira. I didn't want to. I thought there was other more creative solutions that were just better designed. But honestly, it's a great tool for that for that solution. And our teams have learned to love it. I have not, and I don't have to touch it too often in my role anymore. So Jira is our primary product tool um, for for what we would call like our second brain or our kind of um, informational culture content, we this year we switched over to Notion for all of that. So we do all of our, um, you know, our handbook, our culture deck, our um, our craft teams are all organized there. We share all of our best practices, what we call our defaults and our norms. That's all in Notion now. So we're still in the process of kind of refining that and making sure that we manage it well. But um, it's become a more fluid tool than something like Google Docs or you know, um, you know Microsoft Suite that you have to kind of go hunting and pecking for where that document was held. Um, but you know, everything it has to be architected um, well. So I think the big thing with with those tools is they allow us to say what is important and true for Crema, right? And so. What does it mean to be a part of a product team? How, or if you're a new employee, what does it mean to onboard to a new client or to a new team? And so we try to document that and say, these are our defaults. But what Crema practices is the fact that if you have a better way or suggestion that, that we could improve, bring it to the table. Yes. There is nothing sacred here except our purpose as an organization and our values. Those are sacred. Everything else is open to um, the opportunity for everyone to bring something to add to Crema. So we talk about not culture fit, but culture add. Every new hire at Crema is a culture add, not a culture fit. So you need to be willing to come in and say, you're not here to consume the culture, you're here to add to it. And so that that has been, now jump into Notion, learn how we think now, but if you see a better way, you know, comment, bring it up. You know, um, let's discuss it. So, Notion, Jira, um, you know, Slack. We're a, we're a very much a, a rapid communication tool, and you might use Microsoft Teams or something like that. But Slack's been been good for us for a long time, and has been the right tool for us to use and to lean into. We've built some Slack apps, so we nerd out on, on making it our own. Um, and then I think um, we have played with lots of different video solutions. We currently use Zoom as our kind of primary way to communicate with a remote first team. That being said, we've we've tried lots of other fun creative tools to um, 
to facilitate communicating across the team. Things like there's one, there's a really fun one that just came out. Eh, it's been out for a little while, but it's called Butter. It, and and they they live into the name, and it's a fun way to say like, what if our what if our collaborative sessions don't have to be boring? And so it really it leans into the culture of that, and it's been fun. We tried it. It does struggle. at you know fifty plus people, but um, it we, we you know you were always experimenting with what tool is going to be right for for this next phase of Chroma's growth. Um, but I think those are those are kind of our our kind of main go to uh, resources. And then, um, and then honestly, I think the most important resource is intentionality. Yes. It's, it's discipline and intentionality to say no one person is going to be forgotten that they exist on the team. You're not going to be able to hide in a corner, both from a being seen, heard, and known, and also from a not contributing, right? You are going to call you up to be a great contributor to this thing that we're doing, which we think is really important. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Well, look, I could talk for a lot longer, but let's uh, give everyone uh, the time that that I say for the shows, and uh, let's let's go into the uh, sales deep dive. Even though we've been talking a lot about, and and I think it's it's really fitting these days to wear both hats, right? I think the summary of that yeah. is you got to wear a hat to find great people. You got to find, you've also got to find uh, new sales to find great clients that they can work with. So I really like uh, the angle that we've gone today. But uh, the sales deep dive. A quick question, a quick answer. So the first is, now what's the sales habit that you do as a leader each and every day? I get really comfortable with just putting ideas out fast. So if you if you follow me on LinkedIn, you're going to see me post a an idea. It can be very very simple. Just this is my my coffee morning thoughts every single morning, and that discipline gets me way more comfortable to create lots of other content. But if I'm not doing that simple, just post an idea right now while I'm having my first cup of coffee. Um, it, uh, my muscle is, is, you know, I got my little warm up in and I'm ready to produce content for the rest of the day. Brilliant. And, you know, we've talked about a lot of technology, which is great, but what about specific for sales? Is there any uh, specific sales tools that you use? Uh, from a sales tool perspective, <clears throat> we're doing that a lot through, um, our team building relationships through, uh, honestly, through, um, Platforms like LinkedIn or or uh, Twitter, we for our, our CRM specifically, if we're we're looking at like a CRM tool, uh, we're using Airtable, where we uh, created our own custom um, CRM. We couldn't find a sales tool that met the way that we did a lot of referral based sales because ours is a very relational sell. Um, so we found that having our own custom Airtable was a great way to make sure that we're following up with people on a daily basis, that we're providing value, that we're sending them ideas, that we're showing them the content that we created so that they can't forget we exist. Yeah, great. And uh, what, what's the best source of leads for your business? I hate to say it, and everybody's going to say like it's not the full pie, but it's always relationships. It's yeah. always referrals. And so, I mean, I think the reality is, is we, we want people that trust us. And what referral does is it brings some level of trust to the table um, at square one, right? And so what we try to do is build referral networks. We try to build referral relationships. We try to find partners that are willing to send us work and we'll send them work. We um, obviously are using our content as a tool to build trust. So the number one thing in sales, in my opinion, is trust. There's no reason for you to trust me over the many other options you have to go to design and build software unless you've seen in the window through our content to see that we're doing really incredible work in a really incredible way, or someone told you that we do really incredible work in a really incredible way. And that's a referral. Yeah. Yeah. Look, totally, totally agree. And, uh, and the last question is the big question. It's one at the end, but what's one action we can take today to 10 X our sales? I do think the the number one action is always be thinking that every interaction you have is is, is seed. It's you're planting orchards of potential future relationships, yeah. and not to assume that the the next ten days is the sales, but to to be planting seeds that are going to be harvested in three six months eighteen months three years from now, that every single conversation you have is planting a seed. So leave that seed as watered and fertilized and, and ready to grow as possible. So every conversation I have, whether it's a networking, whether it's an event, a conference, a piece of content, a reaction on uh, just a, a responding to a comment on our YouTube videos, 
every single interaction is planting a seed. And so if I can plant the seeds and then water the seeds, then I've got a harvest that just keeps sending me work. Yeah, that's brilliant. Well, look, as I said, we'll have all the links to George's podcast, also to his YouTube. Go and check out him on LinkedIn, his content, because, you know, he's got a team of six dedicated people, but just you you hear in the way that he communicates here, and that goes through all, all of the team and his cultures. So um, you can go to crema.us and also peopleofproducts.us, which will also be the links there. But if you want to go there quickly, uh, go there now and uh, and subscribe. But, uh, George, absolutely wonderful having you here. You've done an amazing job from that you know, second bedroom to, you know, over 60 people now and uh, and helping, you know, companies solve really big problems around the globe. So, um, yeah, it's been awesome having you on today. Thanks, Paul. Such a pleasure. I hope you loved that interview with George as much as I did. You know, I think it's so fitting at the moment where we're all struggling to find great teams and just some of the ways that he looked at it and really considering, you know, your socials, your content for both attracting great talent and also for attracting clients. And sometimes it can be one and the same. But, uh, yeah, I thought it was uh, fantastic. Once again, you can get the summary at paulhigginsmentoring.com forward slash podcast. You can also ask for a full transcript. And, um, you know, why don't you share what you've learned with George on on LinkedIn? As he said, he uh, he's there every day. So why don't you uh, post uh, your key learnings, share it, and uh, he would absolutely love that for giving his valuable time here on the podcast. Uh, also you know, why don't you share it with others too? So if you know that people at the moment are looking to build that culture, build that team, use content to do that. Why don't you share it with them? You know, one, 10, how many people you think would be relevant? They'll think you're an absolute rock star for doing that. Also, please check out our solo shows. And finally, don't forget that free Slack community, uh, the Cloud Consultants Collective. So if you know any SaaS resellers, anyone that's um, selling and implementing SaaS, or as I call it, a cloud consultant, uh, just let them know. It's um, paulhigginsmentoring.com forward slash CCC. One last thing, please take action to accelerate your sales. I'm fired up after today's episode. What about you? But hey, before you go, learning is just one piece of the puzzle. Now it's time to put today's strategy into action. Head over now to today's show page at paulhigginsmentoring.com forward slash podcast and share how you'll put it into action. Be sure to head over to your favorite podcast platform and subscribe, rate, and review the show. Tell me what your favorite episode is. And don't wait one minute more to gain access to your pulse check at paulhigginsmentoring.com. This could be the difference between struggling to get more leads and making this next quarter your best one yet.